Well, this morning we're going to continue in John's gospel. Um, we're going to look at just a few verses uh, in John chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. Uh, just a brief reminder, this is what we call the upper room discourse. These are the last words of our Lord Jesus Christ to His disciples before they go out to the garden to pray, before Jesus is, uh, having been betrayed by Judas, is ar arrested um, by those soldiers that have come out to take Him. Uh, there's a great deal of instruction, there's a great deal of comfort in these words because our Lord Jesus is comforting His disciples who know that they will soon uh, have Jesus taken away from them. So this is what we will look at uh, this morning in verses 7 through 11. Jesus speaking to His disciples says this, If you had known Me, you would have known My Father also. From now on, you know Him and have seen Him. Philip said to Him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. May the Lord bless His Word to our understanding this morning. Now, last time we saw that just after Judas left to betray Jesus, Jesus revealed to His disciples what was going to happen next. Jesus was going to glorify His Father. He was going to go to the cross. He was going to reveal on the cross His Father's justice and that He takes sin very seriously, but also His grace in that He gave His Son to die for all who would put their trust in Him. So Jesus would glorify His Father. In turn, the Father would glorify Him. As we know, He would raise Him from the dead, raise Him up into heaven, seat Him at His right hand, and give Him absolute control over all things that he might bring his reward, his people, his bride, home to heaven. But, as we saw, this meant several things had to happen, none of which really seemed good to the disciples at that particular moment. And I think if we were there, we would be having the same difficulties, the same struggles. Jesus was going to leave. Where he was going, Jesus said the disciples could not follow, at least not now. And he said to Peter, you're going to deny before the, the rooster crows three times, before dawn breaks, you're going to deny that you know me, that you even know me three times. Now, obviously, the disciples were shaken by what Jesus had to say. So Jesus began to comfort them. He told them not to be afraid, but to trust him and to trust his father because they knew what they were doing. This is what had to happen in order to bring them to heaven, that he was leaving but he was leaving to prepare a place for them in his father's house. Again, not that he was going to build a place for them, not that he was going to set up mansions for them, but through his death, through his resurrection, through his ascension, he was opening the doorway into heaven through himself for them. And he said he would come again to receive them when it was time. Not the second coming, that wasn't what he was referring to because he's already come and he's taken his disciples home and yet Jesus has not come in his second coming. But what he meant was when their work in this world was done, he would come to take them home to their father's house, to his father's house. And again, I think the imagery that Jesus is evoking there is that of the Jewish a uh, bridegroom going out to, to get his wife and then bringing her back to the father's house that he might love her and care for her there. Now, Jesus knew the disciples still didn't understand what he was really talking about. I mean, they knew something in their minds, some, had some concept of it, but they didn't fully understand. And so he asked if they knew where he was going and if they knew how to get there. Thomas said what they were likely all thinking in chapter 14, verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? 
Jesus told them in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus says, I'm going to the Father, prepare a place for you, and the way you get there is through me. Now, the disciples may not have known precisely where Jesus was going and how to get there, but there was one thing that they did know. They knew something about the relationship that Jesus had with his Father and who his Father was. They knew that Jesus' Father was the God of Israel, but again, in a very imperfect way. They may not have known how it was possible, but they knew it was true. And they knew that because that's what Jesus had been telling them throughout his ministry. He said earlier to the Jews in the hearing of the disciples in John chapter 8, verse 54, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. Clearly, Jesus identifies His Father as being the God of Israel. And He also told them, regarding his sheep again to the Jews, but with his disciples listening in John chapter 10, verses 29 through 31, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What did Jesus mean by that? He meant that he is God equally with the Father. The Jews understood. That's what he meant, which is why we read next, the Jews picked up stones again, to stone him because they believed he was blaspheming. The disciples knew when Jesus was speaking about his father, he was speaking about God. They knew that he was going to God to prepare a place for them in his house and that he was the only way to God. But they also understood that Jesus was speaking now about a relationship they had with God. I mean, after all, Jesus is going to his father's house to prepare a place for them that He might bring them to the Father's house. They had a relationship with the Father now through faith in Him that really relatively few people had ever experienced. There were some in the Old Testament that, that had. But as we understand in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, there are many, many more. And I believe the disciples were a bit apprehensive it's, it's, as to what Jesus meant by this relationship. Jesus doesn't really ask questions of his disciples, but he basically makes statements to sort of bring those questions they had to the forefront, and I believe that he's doing the same thing here. Just exactly what does it mean to have this relationship with the Father, and who, who is the Father? What is he really like, Jesus? That's really a question that we ought to have as well, because we have that same relationship with Jesus and with the Father, with the Father through Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about what that means and what the Father is like? Now, since Jesus was bringing them to the Father, they were now wondering these very things. What was the Father like? How was the Father going to receive them? And understanding that they had these questions, Jesus now begins to explain the Father a bit more fully. And what I want us to see this morning is basically one thing that to see Jesus is to see the Father. Now, I know that we've all wondered from time to time just what the Father is like, and perhaps we've you know, drawn certain conclusions uh, by you know, reading the Scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, because we think, well, if there's any place in the Bible the, the Father reveals Himself, it has to be in the Old Testament where we see Him interacting with His people, and we see him, as it were, interacting with other nations, and we see some things that, you know, well, some of the things are a bit troubling, aren't they, as far as, um, you know, what, how the Lord portrays himself. And actually, when we understand the Father and we understand God better, we see that what he is doing is always perfect, it's always just. But you know what? We're going to see in just a few moments, and I've already sort of previewed that earlier in the service from John that what we're looking at, when we look in the Old Testament, what we saw in, in the book of Isaiah as far as who was sitting on the throne, or when we see the Lord interacting with His people, whether He's bringing judgment or bringing blessing, that that wasn't necessarily the Father that we were seeing at that point, but rather it was the Son of God. When we get to the New Testament, we get glimpses of the Father as He speaks out of heaven regarding His Son, 
This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And how we should listen to Him. We get these glimpses of the Father. But what is the Father like? The Son of God came to earth in our nature. We know what the Son of God is like because we have seen Him. We see Him in the pages of Scripture. There were four men who wrote about Him and others, of course, who wrote about Him in the letters. We know a great deal about the Son of God. But what about the Father? What would He be like if He came down in the same way that the Son of God did? Well, Jesus tells us what He would be like. He would be the same as He is. That's essentially what Jesus is telling us in our passage. Let's just read it again to get the one main point in verses 7 through 11. Jesus said, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you? And yet you have not come to know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. You know, Philip is essentially saying, Jesus, bring your father here. Let's look at him. Let's see what he's like. Uh, and Jesus says, have I been with you for so long that you have not come to know me? Now, we need to understand what Jesus is saying here, what he means when he says that to know him is to know the father, to see him is to see the father, that they are both the same. Now, we, we need to believe this because the one who is the truth has told us this is the truth. And he says we need to believe this because of the miracles or the works that he has done to prove that what he is telling us are the words of God because the Lord would never endorse a lie. So what does Jesus mean? Well, first of all, we do need to understand that Jesus is not saying, and I know I've said this before, but I need to say it again, he is not saying that he and the Father are the same person. You understand that there are uh, some, perhaps well-meaning individuals, who believe that when Jesus says things like this, that he is identifying himself with the Father, saying that they are, in fact, the same person. The United Pentecostal Church the apostolic church, and I use the word perhaps church or churches in quotation marks because they're missing a rather significant article of the faith, peace of the gospel, without which we really can't be saved. They believe that Jesus is the only person that exists in the Godhead. They believe that the Father is His divine nature, the Son is His human nature, and the Spirit is basically the way that he has chosen to reveal himself now on earth since the assumption or the ascension of his human nature into heaven. Basically, they are Unitarians, uni, meaning one, there's only uh, one person in the Godhead. They are not Trinitarian as uh, Christians, the historic Christian church is Trinitarian. They believe in a God that is one person rather than a God that is three persons. And so basically they believe in a God that is not the God of the Bible. They are trusting in a false God, one who really cannot save them. Any more than the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're also Unitarians, or the God of the Mormons, they're basically polytheists, they believe that these are not one God, but three separate gods, and they believe there are many more gods, and many more gods yet to come. The God of the Bible is one, but He is Trinitarian. He is three persons. Now, from what we see in the Scripture, the names of the three persons are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we know that they are not the same person, clearly. John tells us, or actually Jesus tells us in John chapter 5, verses 20 through 23, things about the relationship the Father and Son have together. And let me ask you if, if this would make any sense. 
is the Father, His divine nature, and the Son, His human nature, so that these two natures are having a relationship, a love relationship with one another? Or are these two persons who love one another? He says this, for the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater things than these so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Now, Jesus is not talking about a nature that is judging, a human nature that's judging, a divine nature that's judging, a divine nature that's loving, a human nature. He's talking about persons. The Father loves the Son. The person of the Father loves the person of the Son. The Father has given to the Son this prerogative to judge so that all might honor the Son. And just as clearly, the Holy Spirit is not the Father and He is not the Son. Jesus will tell us in John 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Clearly, the Spirit of God is distinguished from the Father and the Son. They are distinct persons. They are not the same persons. Jesus is not saying the Father and the Son are the same person. Well, what exactly is He saying? Well, what He is reminding us of is this, that they are the same being. They are the same God. And so they share the same nature. All three of the divine persons share the same attributes so that to see one of them is basically to see the other two. Now, since they are the same in being, they do share certain things in common, basically all things in common, except for their personality and their relationships with one another. Outside of that, everything else is the same. They have the same natural attributes, what we call their infinity, their eternality, the fact that they don't change, and more importantly for our discussion here this morning, the same moral attributes, because that is what Jesus is pointing to here. They have the same perfect love of everything that is good, everything that is just, and they have the same perfect hatred of everything that is evil, everything that is unjust. Now, if the Father had become a man, the difference that we would see, and the only difference we would see, would be expressed in the relationships that He has not in His character. We'd see a difference in the way that He expressed Himself toward the Son and toward the Spirit and the way He expresses Himself toward us with regard to their relationships, but not with regard to character. With regard to character, He would be exactly the same as Jesus. He would respond in the same way that Jesus responded. He would make the same choices Jesus made in each of the circumstances that he was faced with, and he would love us in exactly the same way that the Son loves us. To see Jesus is to see the Father. To know Jesus is to know the Father. Jesus didn't have to show them the Father. He had already showed them the Father by showing them himself. Remember what we saw in our our meditation this morning, what John had said earlier in John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Basically, you know, we were told by John that the Word, who is in the beginning with God, who created all things by His Word, uh, the Word became flesh and He tabernacled among us, that is, He dwelt among us in our nature, so that, John says, He might explain the Father to us, that He might technically uh, exegete Him. You know, like we go into the Scripture and we try to figure out what it says. Well, Jesus comes down to show us what the Father is like. We don't have to try to figure it out because Jesus has already shown us. He's exactly like Jesus. From what John says here, 
Even those, those what we thought were appearances of the Father in the Old Testament were really appearances of our Lord Jesus Christ because no one has ever seen the Father. The Son has come to reveal Him. Now what this means is we know much more about the Father than perhaps we thought. He isn't really a mystery to us any more than the Son is a mystery to us because He has revealed Himself to us in His Son. If you know what Jesus is like, you know what the Father is like. He loves the same things that Jesus loves. He does the same things that Jesus did. As a matter of fact, Jesus said He only did the things He saw His Father doing. They have exactly the same likes and dislikes. And having that same love, having that same commonality, that is why they're able to exist eternally together in perfect love, in perfect harmony. They have a bond of love which is beyond not anything that we can imagine because actually He has given to us His Holy Spirit which is that bond of love that unites them together. The same mind, the same heart, they are in perfect unity. You know, the Father, again, loves you in the same way that Jesus loves you if you are trusting Him this morning. I think that was kind of an interesting thing to think about because, you know, when we're talking about the Lord's Supper, when we're, uh, you know, looking at the Gospels and we're seeing everything that Jesus is doing and we see all that He did to love His disciples and teach them and so forth, we need to understand that the Father is exactly the same. And if we thought of him in any other way, because sometimes we do conceive of the Father as the one who's got, as it were, almost lightning bolts ready to hurl at us, and the Son is standing between us and him, and he's the one who's saying, no, Father, don't, don't destroy them because I've, I've laid down my life for them, and he's pleading for, for mercy and grace. But we need to understand the Father is just as inclined as Jesus. They have the same heart, the same love, the same care for us that Jesus has. They are the same, and the Holy Spirit is the same as well. Now again, that's what Jesus is telling them this morning in our text, but what I'd like to do is now apply this. I want to make one practical application from this. Now we know that Jesus came down from heaven to reveal the Father to us. Clearly, He's already told us that. He's come down to explain Him, but He also came down to do one other thing, and that is to make us like Him, to make us like Jesus, to make us like the Father. He came to transform us into that same image that Jesus reveals of His Father. He wants to make us like Him so that we might share the same kind of relationship that they share with one another, that same love that they have for one another. Jesus intends to give that love to us, and He has if we're Christians, so that we might love them and be loved by them in exactly the same way. Now, Jesus will later pray in the high priestly prayer in John 17, verses 20 through 21. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, that is, my disciples who are here with me in the upper room at this Last Supper, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that is, for all of us who are trusting in Jesus, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The purpose of redemption is to bring us into this same relationship that Jesus has with his Father, this love. But in order to do this, Jesus had to make some changes in us, because we can only have this relationship if we share the same moral image, that same character. Now, you understand, we did not have that character when we came into the world. We came into the world with quite a different character. What David wrote regarding himself as he's explaining why it is he committed adultery with Bathsheba was equally true of us when we came into the world in Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. We came into this world in the flesh, we were slaves of the flesh, we were the slaves of sin, and in this condition we were not the friends of God, we were His enemies. I know that sounds like a harsh thing to say, 
But that's exactly the condition that God found us in, which is why in Romans chapter 5, Paul is trying to show us how great the love of God is. And he says, while we were his enemies, God sent his son to die for us. Well, we read the same thing in what David writes in Psalm 5, verses 4 through 5. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. And when you read what the Bible has to say about our condition apart from Christ, we were those who did nothing but sin. And so this is how, at least one of the things going on in God with regard to us as we came into the world. He, we, well, he, he hated us. We were his enemies. And yet, as he tells us to love our enemies, so the Lord loved his people. He sent his son so that whoever trusts in him would live and not die. But this was our condition coming into the world. And of course, in this condition, we could not have this relationship with God. But God changed that. The Father changed that by sending Jesus into the world. Jesus gave his life on the cross so he might take away our sins and reconcile us to God. And, and here's the important thing. I mean, the other is important too, but this is important as well. He also gave us his spirit, his spirit, so that the spirit of God might from within us work the same nature that the son possesses and the father possesses, that he might give us the same heart, give us the same moral character that he has. That's what Peter means when he writes in 2 Peter 1, verse 4, for by these, that is, um, you know, through his son and so forth, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. We came into the world corrupt. We were by nature, Paul says, children of wrath. But through Jesus Christ, God has made a way for us to become partakers of the divine nature. doesn't mean that we become God in the sense that we become metaphysically the same being as God and we're no longer creatures, but now we're the creator. But it means we become like Him morally. Now, Jesus put it another way in His prayer in John 17, which we're going to get to in a few weeks. He says in His prayer that the love that the Father has for Him lives in us, and He lives in us. And He's talking here about the same thing that Peter was talking about, the divine nature, the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 26, And I have made your name, that is the Father's name, known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me, Jesus said, may be in them, and I in them. This love with which the Father loves the Son is the Holy Spirit, and He now dwells in us. And now that the Spirit of God dwells in us, Christ dwells in us, and now that He is in us, He is transforming us into this same image of God that Jesus is. Now, I should mention that this transformation into the image of God isn't something that He reserves for heaven. In heaven, it will be perfect. Perfection is reserved for heaven. But it's something that we experience in our lives now. That's what Paul means when he writes in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 through 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, that is liberty from sin. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. Basically, again, He's given us the Spirit so that we might be transformed into that same image, not all at once, but He says from glory to glory, from one level of glory to the next, we are growing into the image of Christ. We are being made like Jesus, and so we are being made like the Father. We are sharers of the divine nature, moral nature of God. In a certain sense, though in a very imperfect one, just as Jesus said to his, well, to Philip and to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, 
It's also true that those who see us should see Jesus and they should see the Father because we are like them. That's why the disciples, you know, were first called Christians in Antioch. The word Christian means little Christ. They saw all these people who said they believed in Jesus acting like Jesus. And so they called them Christians because they were like Christ. Well, that, that again is reflecting exactly what it is the Father sent His Son into the world to do, which is to transform us into His image. So we don't become eternal, we don't become infinite or changeless like God, but we do become like Him morally. Now what that means is we then begin to love what He loves and we hate what He hates. We say what He would say. We do what He would do. We act as He would act if He were in our situation. We approve of what He approves of and we disapprove of what he disapproves. Now, not perfectly. <laughs> It'd be nice if it were perfect, but it's not perfect. We still have to struggle, but we do it. And how do we do it? Well, we do it naturally because it's a new nature that is inside of us, a new inclination toward the things we used to hate, but now we love. And a disinclination toward the things we used to love, now we hate. So we have this new inclination moving us away from what we were like before, from this worldly corruption to now this morality, this holiness that reflects the nature of God. It's not really even a decision that we have to make in a certain sense on our part. It is our nature. It is that new man that, we are, that is being formed in us. We are being made like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I say in a certain sense because on the other hand, we still do have to make a decision because of the sin nature that's still in us, that inclination to away from what's good and towards what is evil. The choice now that we have to make is which of these two inclinations are we going to yield to? The new nature that, that loves the things God loves and hates what He hates or the old nature that hates what He loves and loves what He hates? Well, thankfully, if we are Christians... The strongest desire within us, generally speaking, we realize that there are some exceptions, but generally speaking will be to follow the new nature and to choose what it is that is pleasing to God. Our grace can become weak so that we don't want the things that, that God wants as strongly as the other things, and we will choose things that are sinful. But generally speaking, as John reminds us in 1 John 3, we will practice righteousness. We will live As the Lord would live, we would, again, make, make decisions, make valuations, uh, again, approving of what He would approve of and disapproving of what He disapproves of. We would be like Jesus in this world. Now, when we happen to run into those situations where we can't seem to tell the difference between what really is good and what really is evil... And sadly, there's still going to be those times, even though we would, would like to say there aren't. But particularly when we're young and inexperienced in the Lord, but even when we get older, when somehow the distinction seems too close and we can't seem to see clearly what it is we're supposed to do, what are we going to do? Well, the new nature is going to lead us to the very thing that's going to resolve the issue for us, and that is to the Bible where we can read about Jesus Christ, where we can get to know Jesus Christ and we can understand more of what He's like. And then we can go to the letters and we can read more about the interpretations of, of Jesus Christ and what it is He did and how He would have us to live. And we go to the Old Testament and we look at the law of God that Jesus came to fulfill, that He kept perfectly as an example for us. And the Spirit of God will show us what the right thing is. You know, as Christians, we're going to have these two desires, and we have to choose between them. If we can't tell the difference, what are we going to do? Just go with what you feel like? Well, that's a dangerous way to live, isn't it? Because we often feel like doing the wrong thing. We have to know that what we're doing is what the Lord wants us to do. We have to know that it's what Jesus would want. I think more times than not, we do know. But if there's any question, the Bible tells us. It tells us everything that we need to know. I'll tell you this. One of the ways you can tell is the way that the Lord wants us to go will more often than not be directly the opposite of what the world wants and what the world is doing. 
because the world marches to a different drum. They're going a different direction. They are children of wrath until they come to faith in Christ. It's what we used to be. But now we have a changed nature that makes us go a different direction. We are swimming against the stream, and that's why it's difficult to be a Christian in a non-Christian world. It's why we have to make decisions that aren't so popular and perhaps even bring some ridicule upon ourselves. But the point is, we need to become more like Jesus. Now, the fact that we are becoming more like Jesus, that we're becoming more like the Father, this is how we know that we have been born again. This is how we can know we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us because He's working in Christ's nature in us from the inside out because we are making decisions that Jesus would make because we are desiring the things that Jesus would desire and we're turning away from the things Jesus would turn away from. And by the way, that is also the way that the Lord advances His kingdom is by our making these kinds of choices and doing what Jesus would do if He were in our place. Our lives have to stand out from the world around us, otherwise they are not even going to be able to see Jesus. And they're certainly not going to listen to us as we bring the gospel to them. Now the Bible says there will be a difference between the believer and the unbeliever. If there was no difference between what we were before and what we were after, there would really be no way of knowing at all that the Lord had had mercy upon us or not. If there was no difference between us and the people of the world, then the kingdom of heaven would not advance because there wouldn't be anything to, to make it advance. There wouldn't be that light to shine, that, that salt, that light, that thing to provoke them, to make them think, to convict them of sin. We need to be different. Remember how Jesus said, that the way the people would know that we are His disciples is by our love for one another, which means they would see a difference in us. We would be loving one another the way that Jesus has loved us. There is a difference. So that we can know that we are the children of God, the Lord has made a difference, but there's also a difference so that the kingdom of God can advance. So understanding the plan of salvation the Father sent His Son into the world to show us what He was like. The Father sent the Son into the world to do the work that was necessary to make us like Him. Um, we can know that if we are becoming like Him then, that He has done that work for us, that we are His children. Let me just close by saying this, two things really. If you do know Him and you see His image being formed in you, well then rejoice because you know that you are true believers in Christ. Don't be satisfied with the level that you're at right now. Remember the sanctification, growth and grace is not something that happens automatically. It's something that we actually have to put effort into. We have to work and cooperate with God in order to grow into the image of Christ. So that's the message for us. If we see that image, rejoice, but let that joy and that love you have for the Lord move you to become more like Him, to do more for Him. But secondly, if you don't see that image of Christ in you, if you don't have that inclination to choose what He would have you to choose, if you don't love what He loves and hates what He hates, if you find yourself at odds with Him in Scripture and you find that your heart and your mind really isn't that, then you need to be born again. Let me encourage you this morning to turn to Jesus Christ and trust in Him. Turn from your sins and believe on Him. He offers Himself to you and to everyone as a Savior. As a matter of fact, He said on one occasion that anyone who comes to me, I will not cast him out. He will receive everyone who comes to Him. Now, He is the only one who can make this change in your heart. So you need to come to Him. Come to Him and ask Him to give you His Spirit. Ask for this new birth. Ask Him to make you like Himself because He is the only one who can. Now, having said this, um, we have the privilege this morning of uh, coming to the table. And obviously what I've just said makes a distinction between who it is that the, the Lord has laid this table for and who it is He has not laid it for. The Lord tells us that if we belong to Him, 
If we love Him, if we're trusting Him, if we're turning from our sins, then we may come to this table to celebrate the very thing that made us this way, and that is the love of God who sent His Son into the world to live for us and to die for us. Uh, we are to remember what Jesus did here, His love for us, His example. And we are to love Him and we are to follow this example. This is what the Supper calls us to do. But we're also warned in Scripture that if we haven't trusted Jesus, if we're not turning away from our sins, we should not come to the table because there is a warning in Scripture about eating and drinking judgment to ourselves if well, if we haven't trusted Jesus and yet we're coming to a table that declares Jesus, that, that's basically hypocrisy, and we don't want to be guilty of hypocrisy. So let's, as we bow for just a moment, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to um, show us where we're at. Let's ask Him to prepare us to come to the table, and if we find or if we have, as we've been thinking about our own lives, as we've gone through this text, if we've come to the conclusion we don't know Him, then may the Lord give you grace to reach out in faith now to Christ and to put your trust in Him in order that you might truly know Him and have His work in your soul. Let's, let's bow for a few moments of prayer and ask the Lord for prayers to come.